we'll, we'll obviously do our opening statements and then there'll be an exchange between the members and yourselves. Um, you're, you're very welcome and thank you very much for coming in, um, particularly those of you who have travelled. Um, we do appreciate it. So, um, we'll, uh, well, we're the, we've been put into public session, so I, I should uh, do the formalities and we'll go from there. So I'd like to welcome uh, members and also viewers who may be watching proceedings on Oireachtas TV to the public session of the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Children and Youth Affairs. The purpose of the meeting today, of course, is to discuss the recruitment and retention of social workers with representatives of third-level institutions. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome Dr. Uh, Breda McTaggart, the head of the Department of Social Science at IT Sligo, and Ms. Uh, Brenda Feeney, course director, also at the Institute of Technology in Sligo. And I also welcome uh, from the Irish Universities Association, Dr. Carmel Holton, senior lecturer of uh, Social Work School of Applied Social Studies, University College in Cork, and Professor Michelle Norris, head of School of Social Policy, Social Work and Social Justice, uh, UCD, and uh, Professor Robbie Gilligan, Professor of Social Work School of Social Work and Social Policy at Trinity. So you're all very welcome and thank you very much for uh, attending this morning. Before we commence, in accordance with procedure, I am required to draw your, your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence in connection with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons, or entity by, by name or in a way to make him, her, or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise, nor make charges against a person outside of the House or an official either by name in a way to make him, her or it identifiable. And may I remind you to please switch off your mobile phones or switch them to flight mode as they tend to interfere with our recording systems and broadcasting facilities. So um, we wouldn't want anything that you say to be, to be missed. Um, I wish to also advise you that any submission or opening statement you have made to the committee will be published on the committee website after this meeting. After your presentation, there will be members, uh, questions, I should say, from the members of the committee. Um, so I'd now like to call on uh, Dr. McTaggart uh, to please make your opening statement. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, the committee, for inviting us here this morning. Um, the Institute of Technology Sligo is a higher education provider who develops and delivers programs of learning to over 6,500 students at undergraduate, master's and doctorate level. It is a leader in online learning, is research active across all areas and has at its core a focus on the development of its region and its citizens. The Department of so Social Sciences in IT Sligo is one of the largest departments in the Institute. It caters for the learning needs of over 650 students at undergraduate and postgraduate level. In 2015, the team and I carried out a review of our regional education and employment needs. From this review, we developed and sought validation from a number of awards on undergraduate and postgraduate level, inclusive of a Master's in Social Work. The Master's in Social Work is the first Social Work Award to be delivered in an Institute of Technology. It has been developed in response to student requests for this award within the Northwest region, a national shortage of social workers, a number of policy documents which advocate widening access and education, and the need to meet an employment and skills shortage. As you are all aware, there is waiting lists for social work expertise across all services, including children and young people, care of the elderly and the disability sector. This is even after sustained recruitment and retention drive across all these sectors. The reality exists that this is set to continue as demand for social workers has not been met by the supply of graduates. And retention of social workers within specific posts are acknowledged as challenging. A large number of vacancies consequently remain unfilled. The Institute of Technology Sligo and the Department of Social Science is reflective of the non-traditional higher education space, where our students are often the first generation to higher education within their family, and many are in receipt of grant funding. Students who begin their studies in our department work very hard throughout programs and graduate with qualifications that support them to attain better life opportunities and outcomes for themselves, their families, and for the communities in which they'll work and live. However, because of the Institute's lack of provision within specific learning spaces, we were concerned that we were contributing to equity of access to in-demand learning opportunities for our student cohort. In 2016, we made the decision to address this by, by the introduction of this award. 
The programme team and I began the work in 2006. In 2008, we sought and secured under delegated authority QQI Level 9 validation for a two-year full-time award in social work. In September 2018, the, the programme commenced with a small cohort of ambitious and excited graduates or students. They are currently on their first professional learning placement. As this is a new department for the Institute of Technology sector, it did raise some questions about whether we should be delivering in this field. The answer to this question is social, social work is a regulated profession on the Health and Social Care Professionals Act. Consequently, all programmes will be reviewed and must be reviewed by the professional regulator, Carew. The Masters in Social Work has made an application to Carew and we will be reviewed by a professional regulator in autumn of this year. There are a small number of challenges when developing and implementing a social work award. They are not insurmountable but are worth noting as we, we try and work collectively to resolve the ongoing issues of social work recruitment and retention. These include educational providers are dependent on the goodwill of services to accept and supervise students on professional learning opportunities. It is a significant challenge to secure even a small number of placement and it's prohibiting us increasing our numbers. Students on newly developed professionally regulated programmes comment without the insurance that the programme will be as successful as part of a validation process. This is a personal and financial risk for potential students and does impact on the numbers that we recruit. Any changes to the offering of an approved programme going from full-time to part-time delivery models requires a new validation process. If one of the offerings is unsuccessful, both may be affected by this. This is because the specific award title, i.e. Masters of Social Work, and the Academic Institute is recorded on their approved bylaw. And as is normal for all students who wish to return to full-time studies, there are cost implications, both in terms of fees and maintenance. Students who were in employment in the previous year may be above the threshold of grant funding for year one, hence the financial burden is increased in year one. Suggestions of funded bursaries would be welcome, provided it does not impact on a student securing in grant funding. The issues of retention, while recruitment is one part of the social work shortage puzzle, retention is the other. This was discussed by the Irish Association of Social Workers to the Joint Committee last Mar in March of this year. We would support suggestions put forward by our colleagues and reiterate the importance of quality supervision, streamlining of work practices and manageable caseloads as key factors in any successful retention strategy. We would add that recruitment and retention strategies need to coexist as one impacts directly on the other. In conclusion, we acknowledge this is a complex multifactorial problem and any solution, sustainable solution will require many different and interrelated strategies. The team and I had and have a responsibility to its potential students and its region to provide appropriate education and learning opportunities to the required standard in an area where employment needs exist. So social work is one of these areas. We welcome the opportunity to be part of any resolution strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. McTaggart. I now invite Dr. H uh, Holton, I should say, to, to uh, give us your opening statement. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairperson for inviting us here this morning to present on this really important matter of the recruitment and retention of social workers. By way of introduction, I'm Carmel Halton. I'm the director of the Master of Social Work Programme in University College in Cork. To my left is Professor Michelle Norris, who is the Professor of Social Work and Head of School of Social Work, Social Policy and Social Justice in University College Dublin, and Professor uh, Robbie Gilligan, who is the Professor of Social Work and Social Policy in Trinity College Dublin. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to present to the committee on this important um, matter. Um, we have circulated a discussion document. The discussion document was the result of collaboration between all of the four universities who are currently providing uh, accredited social work programmes, University College Dublin, Trinity College Dublin, National University of Ireland, Galway and UCC. Um, because of the time allocated to us here this morning, we have prepared a short document, a statement, uh, which is an abbreviation of the discussion document that you have already received. Um, our opening statement to the committee this morning focuses primarily on social work education in Ireland and the supply of graduates. In our statement, we identify and set out proposals for addressing the main barriers to increasing the numbers of placements on our current professional social work pro programmes. These are, one, the availability and organisation of student practice fieldwork placements and the funding needs of students. Currently, all four universities collectively provide two undergraduate degrees and four postgraduate degrees in social work. The two undergraduate programmes are provided by UCC and Trinity, and the four master's degrees in social work are provided by all four universities represented here today. These programmes are all accredited by Carew, the regulatory body for health and social care professionals. For your information, social work education involves both academic training in the university and also carefully planned intensive fieldwork practice training. 
In all, 50% of social work students' time is spent on fieldwork placement, and the remaining 50% of their time is spent in academic study. So placements, as you can imagine, are a critical component of all social work education. Uh, in this presentation, we will first address the matter of professional education and the supply of graduates. Currently, Irish universities graduate approximately 210 professionally qualified social workers per annum. They are highly valued in the profession, as is reflected in their high employability rates nationally and internationally. The universities acknowledge the current demands on TUSLA in areas of recruitment and retention of social workers. As university providers of social work education, we would like the committee to know that we are committed to engaging with all social work employers, including TUSLA, towards resolving the recruitment and retention challenges represented to this committee. However, in addressing the problems faced in this area, universities face also significant challenges. Undoubtedly, one of the major challenges we face is in accessing high-quality social work placements that will accommodate our current student numbers. These placements form an essential element of social work training, and strict standards are set by CARU regarding training requirements for placement supervisors. While we have been attempting to address the problems of placement provision for some time, more recently, all universities have been engaged in collaboration with the DYCA towards developing a strategy to address these challenges of supply. While we are open to increasing our intake of social work students with a view to creating a sustainable supply of new graduates, any expansion is predicated on an increase in the supply and availability of high quality student placements and applicants also to our programmes. So we suggest towards the achievement of an increasing in, in, in increase in numbers of students on our programmes, we have a, a number of following suggestions to make. Students are required, as I've said, to undertake at least two extended unpaid work-based placements of 14 weeks in duration in the course of their professional social work training. In order to pass and progress to graduation, students must successfully achieve standards of practice that meet with criteria and standards of proficiency as, pres as prescribed by CARU. It is important to note that these placements can incur significant costs to students, costs such as travel, subsistence, and having to relocate to geographical regions where placements are available. Because of the substantial practice placement component of social work education, students must factor in these costs in addition to high fees before deciding to undertake a programme of study. The funding issue is significant as many social work students have no access to public funding in the form of government grants and scholarships. And even those who do qualify for some funding they are not reimbursed for many additional costs incurred during the course of their training. As we have noted, key to the any expansion of student numbers and by implication of student graduates is to increase the number of suitable student placements and this will require employers to address a number of current barriers to placement availability. These barriers include limited office accommodation, lack of structures of support for placement supervisors, large caseloads, the availability of sufficient numbers of placement supervisors who meet crew standards and the development of CPD initiatives that respond to the ongoing training and development needs of qualified social workers who are the the actual supervisors of our students. In responding to the placement challenges identified previously, the universities do recognise that there is a need for the development of diverse and creative approaches to student placements. These include the development of high quality long arm supervision across a variety of agencies, the development of practice learning units, the establishment of specialist clinical supervision posts and the promotion of lead specialist practice learning teams. In the past, many of these initiatives have been in operation and we are currently considering their reintroduction. We do suggest that a commitment is required of employers to embedding practice placement supervision in social work employment contracts, as was originally envisaged with the creation of the senior practitioner role in the HSE and TUSLA. Relationships between the universities and social work employers and placement providers also need to be formalised into memoranda of understanding. These would include protocols for the sharing of sensitive data on student performance, which are necessary to conform to data protection legislation. In addition to considering matters related to placement expansion, we also are considering diverse approaches to social work education. As university educators of social workers, for over eight decades, decades, we are committed to exploring new models of social work training that increase the supply of social workers. Discussions are already underway with CARU in relation to exploring possible options which comply with CARU accreditation requirements. Because social workers practice in very high demanding health and social care contexts that require a significant period of education, skills development and professional development, our opinion is that social work education cannot be fast-tracked. Regardless of the model adopted, it must equate to existing accredited programmes in terms of the time devoted to the professional formation of social workers. In summary, we recognise that there may be uh, many innovative ways to deliver social work programmes which will require forward planning and development with all the parties concerned. 
Um, and previously, the universities have demonstrated a high commitment to engaging with employers in developing innovative, uh, innovative accredited social work programmes. For example, UCD modified aspects of their MSW programme to accommodate needs in the probation service, and also UCC established an undergraduate social work degree at BESW for mature student entry to increase the diversification of applicants into social work. Trinity and NUIG have also developed their master's degrees in response to uh, uh, increasing demands of employers. We believe that university providers of social work education have a good record of collaboration with employing organisations towards achieving change. Previously, we have collaborated with the Department of Health who provided resources in the late 1990s that led to the doubling of student numbers on our programmes. In addition, social work programmes have been proactive in visiting and expand, revisiting and expanding their academic and practice curricula in response to changing demands from practice. These developments have equipped newly qualified social workers to engage more effectively with the social changes faced by service users. In relation to the recruitment and retention of social workers in child protection and welfare, we fully recognise the importance of serving the recruitment needs of TUSLA, as well as other employers of social workers. We believe that an important consideration in recruitment of high calibre candidates is the need for public education campaigns to promote social work career choices aimed both at school leavers and more mature applicants who are considering career changes. The focus of this committee's work has been on child protection and welfare social work. And while we appreciate that TUSLA is the larger employment of social workers in Ireland, there are other significant employers. For example, the, he the Health Service Executive, the Probation Service, wider disability services and civil society sector. These employers all have an important role to play in responding to the needs of vulnerable service users outside of child protection and welfare sector. Therefore, in considering our submission document, we would respectfully request that the committee seeks to avoid any unintended consequences for the wider labour market of social workers and equally for social work education, which has a responsibility to serve all parts of the profession equally and has served it over many years. While increasing the supply of social work graduates is necessary, we propose that issues of staff retention cannot be addressed solely by increasing supply. We need to find ways to retain uh, and care for existing child protection and welfare social workers. We know from what social workers tell us on the ground that their decisions to leave child protection and welfare social work are due to the factors such as incessant and rapid pace of organisational change, excessive workloads and insufficient staff supports and supervision. While child protection and uh, welfare social work can be rewarding, stimulating and important work, it is also extremely challenging, as the committee know. There is significant international literature outlining, outlining the impact of social work on social workers. To promote retention, social workers that undertake this work require a high level of staff welfare, early career support measures, structured induction programmes, protected caseloads and professional supervision to mitigate the impact of the work. Our concluding points. In summary, as social work educators, we want the committee to know that we are ready and willing to play our part in increasing the supply of qualified Carew accredited professional social workers. In order to progress towards the expansion of our student numbers, we suggest the following actions need to be taken. Establish campaigns to promote social work as a career choice. Increase the supply of placements in conjunction with TUSA and other employers. Establish a bursary scheme, including fees and placement costs, to attract high calibre candidates onto our social work degrees. Provide support structures that give due recognition to the particular challenges experienced by child protection and welfare social workers, as mentioned above. We would like to thank the committee for the time given to hearing our submission, and we invite any questions you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Holton. I do appreciate um, both opening statements. Thank you very much. Um, it will be very helpful in the context of the um, completion of our report on this matter, which we hope to produce um, relatively soon. Um, just before I invite um, uh, Senator Freeman to, to, to commence uh, questions from the members, I just had a couple of points that I wanted to make that perhaps could offer a little bit of clarity. Um, and and I, I actually struggled to get to grips with the reasons for difficulties in securing placements. And you, you re both referenced um, certain commitments that need to be made by other bodies and I just wanted maybe for you to, to, to provide the committee with some additional information on that, uh, on, on, on the record, so to speak. And the other question that I have is, are your educational facilities at capacity in terms of demand, as opposed to um, your ability to, to cater for more students? 
So is the demand being, are the applicants there through the, through the, through the leaving certificate and, and, and um, other, other age level entries into, into your educational facilities? Um, is there a capacity there? So whomever want, wants to start, oh, sorry. Um, yes, please. Uh, sure, Professor. Morris, you sorry, today. thank you, I can't um, see your name. Can I just, uh, just to respond to your, your question about student placements, Chairman. Um, I think the, the anyway, uh, our, the situation for social work placements, I think that the best way to clarify it is, is maybe to compare us to the other social professions, the other health professions. So for instance, within University College Dublin, um, we provide degrees in nursing, medicine, social work. Nursing colleagues, the St. Vincent's Hospital is part of the university, and um, the placement part of the, of the degree is automatically provided. Mm. So aut automatically, however many hundred placements they require are automatically provided. They can be guaranteed. In the social work school, we start with the standing uh, from a position of zero placements every year. And we have 50 students a year on our two-year program, mm. 100, 100 students in, in total. And we need to, um, so this year our figures are that we had to make arrangements with the 141 individual social workers to place those 100 students. Now, the reason for that is, is so we, we ring up individual social workers and make agreements with them to take the student on placement. We don't get any placements provided to us centrally by the employers. TUSLA have three, I think, um, in total liaison people who will help us in individual parts of the country, but there are no guaranteed placements. Um, a proportion of those arrangements break down. Um, we find uh, the, the, the breakdown rate of arrangements is particularly high in areas like child protection in TUSLA because of turnover of staff and just mm. pressure. Mm. So we then go out and have to secure more placements. And um, we have a couple of concerns about this. The first issue is, if a student comes to us and we register them on our social work degree, we are contractually obliged to deliver that programme, including the two placements. Um, so unless we can be sure of placements, we, we, uh, we have concerns about taking in students. Our experience in recent years in the Dublin region is delivering more placements is very challenging. We find it particularly difficult for students who need to repeat a placement. And on occasions in recent years, we have had to approach over 100 social workers to try place a repeat student. Other concerns we have are that we don't have a formal relationship with the employer organisation. So this has raised concerns, for instance, around GDPR issues, because we may need to share sensitive information about the student um, that's relevant to their performance on placement. Um, so uh, that, uh, so it, it, that is anomalous within these types of professions and we know that the HFE has moved to try address this for instance for radiographers um, and if this was done in social work um, it would really have a transformative um, uh, impact on the sector. Now, you uh, might not elaborate on that please Professor Norris just in relation to the radiographers. Uh, well, we we're currently part of a committee um, established by the um, Department of Children and Youth Affairs that's looking at increasing um, places on social work training programmes, um, as, as my colleague um, Dr. Halton mentioned. And this has been very, very positive development for us. And at that meeting, um, the colleagues from the HSE raised that this was also a barrier in some of the uh, health professions and they have moved to try regularise these arrangements. Um, uh, so so that, that's just a practical barrier. We also have concerns around the impact of this just on the student experience. Now, I, I do wish to acknowledge that the social workers who take our, pla our students on placement um, give a super service but the, and are very committed to what we call practice teaching, in other words, supporting the students learning on placement. Um, but the facts are that the, because the student doesn't have a kind of formal role in the organisation, it can mean there's just an uneven experience in terms of having office space, etc. Students often are required to travel for work. They, they take on a proportion of a qualified social worker's caseload and um, are, are, are expected to manage that. So they're required to use their car they don't get mileage 
and for m most of our graduates, or our students are young people, not all, but, but, but for, for students in full-time education, these things can be quite a significant barrier. So the, the placement issue um, is really a critical one for us. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Gideon. Thank you. Uh, just to add to what my colleagues are saying, I think uh, the, the, the issue of capacity in the system, in the employer system, to take students is really a critical part of the whole jigsaw. Um, we find when we approach uh, agencies that, that uh, take our students, they uh, often say, we don't have desk space to mm. take your students. Mm. We don't have spare capacity. We are short of staff who can take on supervision responsibilities for the students. Uh, I'm not saying these things as criticism. These are the realities mm -hmm. that we're dealing with. And if so, we really need to th 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 see this in a quite systemic way. There needs to be investment in the infrastructure. Uh, phys physical space, in in many cases, is a barrier, so that they can't actually accommodate additional students because they've been hiring additional staff who have uh, filled any uh, space that was there to be filled in, in office accommodation. This may seem like a small matter, but this is, these are the practical barriers sure. that we want the committee to be aware of. Yes. And also just the staff time, student supervision and support and learning requires staff time. It has to be uh, seen as something that has to be invested in. So we're going to increase uh, <coughs> capacity for training across the system. We have to invest in the infrastructure in terms of staff support and physical space. These are practical but really crucial uh, issues that make the difference between whether we, we find placements for our students or not and where we find those placements. Okay. Um, Dr. McTaggart, please. Um, I concur exactly with everything they've said there. There is, we have only a small cohort this year, and the reason we can't increase it, we, it takes about one to three. We get one place in every three we contact. They are absolutely enthusiastic. They have been nothing but supportive in the Northwest, but the reality is, is they can't take the students on placement because they either it is usually to do with workload up with us, caseload, and, and my colleague looks after that activity. But it's genuinely, there is an interest, there is a commitment, but they just don't have the capacity to do it within their teams at this moment in time. And there is very clear guidance of what kind of person can look after a student on placement and how long they have to be in post. So it's kind of self-perpetuating. It's going round and round and round. And I am from the nursing profession. Absolutely, we never had this problem because there was designated learning and teaching spaces. This is not a part the practice teachers, as Carmel has rightly, our professors rightly has said, there is no requirement. It is on voluntary capacity, and they're doing up in the northwest is what I can speak to. They're doing their absolute best to try and accommodate us, but they cannot do so. So I suppose I would like to confirm and support what my colleagues have said. Okay. Okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Halton. Briefly. The more recent challenge in relation to acquiring placements in Tusa relates to issues around retention and uh, the moving of people around different areas. A requirement of Carew is that people are in their job for at least 12 months, you know, and so therefore they can't take a student until they have been in the job for 12 months. So that means then uh, a very important element of, of practice sort of placement is the child protection and welfare field. However, uh, when people are moving around and they're being promoted because it's a new, a relatively new organisation, so there's a lot of movement going on, it means that people that would previously have taken students and are really committed to it can't for a period of time. So there are periods in time when, when, when we actually can't get placements with people. And, and, and sorry, apologies to Senator Freeman. I mean, is the creation of a formalised arrangement, is that, is that practice, is it possible? I mean, how, how would you do it if well, you were going to... possible in the other disciplines uh, yes, that well, Professor uh, uh, Norris has mentioned, uh, in medicine and nursing and in other disciplines, there, uh, there is... Uh, the, the, the mechanisms are in place. I think what has to happen is we have to put the uh, effort into creating those similar mechanisms in this field of social And, work. and it, is it a case of replication or is it something very unique? Well, there are similarities. Am I, I over-complicating over it? Well, just, just to say that's what we're currently trying to do. We're okay. engaged with the, the DYCA in collaborations to see what kind of systems would best respond to the challenges that we presented in the discussion okay. documents, which are well, challenges we all agree with. I think with. you'd be interested, or we would be as interested as you are in the outcome of that particular process. But look, thank, thank you for that. 
Uh, Senator Freeman, please. Uh, good morning, and, and thank you for your presentation. You gave such an enormous amount of information that I'm completely and utterly uh, confused here and, and baffled and, and amazed also at, at, at all that's going on for you. So I'm going to simplify it for my sake, the questions. Um, so the first, first one is, th there seems to be two issues here. One is about the education of social workers. That, that's one issue. Um, and I, I don't know if you have a problem with uh, attracting uh, new careers in social work. But So one of them is, is the social workers, uh, the educational parts where, um, and you're talking about placements, and the chair did ask a couple of the questions I was going to ask, but just to um, um, broaden on one of them. Uh, you mentioned, Dr. Halton, um, uh, the, the issue of uh, high-quality high placements. Uh, and I'd love to know what you mean by high-quality, because uh, Dr. McTaggart said that, you know, out of every three uh, requests that you put in, you only get one placement. So, so are you sort of scraping the barrel, too, at times, because you're not getting any, any placements? So that's the first thing, you know, what is, uh, is high-quality? Who is responsible? Who, who is the HSC the, the people you should be talking to when you're looking for um, improvement on um, placements, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, about the expenses for your students when they are travelling? Is it the HSC? Uh, and the second thing is, when uh, 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 the, the other members here were, we were part of a, a committee called the Future of Mental Health, and one of our biggest issues was the recruitment and retention of staff, psychiatric staff in particular. But when we investigated what the problem was with the recruitment, it was the long, long process, complicated, ridiculous process that people had to go through in order to get the job as a social worker, as a, a, a psychiatric nurse or, or doctor. So I'd love to know what is the process? Who, who's in, again responsible for it? So in other words, with the psychiatric uh, nurses and doctors, there were 42 steps that they had to take before they could even get to the interview stage. So, um, th so that's the question I really would like to know uh, uh, about that. Um, the high quality, the, the, the step by step, if you don't mind. Um, and um, what was the other one I wanted to ask you? Uh, Yes, exactly. That's, that's the most important one. <laughs> okay, thank you. So maybe I'll take the first questions and maybe some of the other groups. Yes, okay. So the first one around high quality calibre placements. Uh, placements currently are required by Carew <coughs> to have certain regulations associated with them. So all supervisors have to have a training and qualification in, in supervision, some form of training and okay. supervision. So. If um, you remember what um, Professor Norris has said, we have always had a tradition in the universities of going directly to practice educators, to supervisors, to, to social workers, and asking them to take our students mm. on placement. Now we have to look to make sure that they comply with all of the regulations, which is a good thing. We're not saying it's a bad thing, it's a good thing. Uh, that they're registered social workers with, with CRU, that they have training and education in, super, in, in supervision of students, and also that they're in post for a year at least a year. So that's mm. what we mean by high okay. calibre, that there are regulations associated with the recruitment yeah. of, of people to do this really important work. All right, thank you. That's a good answer. Thank you. So to address the question of who is responsible, I understand the question in terms of who's responsible overall for the workforce planning for social work. Is, is, that's exactly yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, well, this is a really crucial question, actually, because a, TUSLA and the Department of Children and Youth Affairs are obviously very important actors in this, but they're only one, one component of the whole picture. Health service executive, disability, mental health area, as you know. Uh, there are many uh, non-governmental uh, organisations that provide services, probation service, drug services, many, many uh, uh, sectors hire social workers. Uh, at the moment, we don't have one desk in government which is responsible for, for workforce planning for social work. You don't okay. have anybody. No, it's not, the uh, not on the employer side. The employers are, are fragmented. They're, they're uh, different organisations. So okay. there isn't one voice nice. that we can negotiate with about social work. That's where the planning, problem is. Social work, workforce planning. I mean, obviously, there's the uh, 
higher education authority, but that's on the provider side of education. Mm. It's not on the employer mm. side. Mm. So there is a need. We don't have, for example, that I can find anyhow, national data on wh where are social workers actually employed. We don't have national data on projected uh, needs of social work employed empl for employment. These are uh, pretty important uh, planning requirements. Mm. So one desk, uh, a, a coordinated approach to planning for, for, for social work across sectors, mm. because social work now spans Department of Justice, Depar mm. Department of Health, Department of Children and Youth Affairs, mm. other departments as well. Uh, no, but no, there isn't a weak, there isn't a lead uh, department on this at the moment. Children and Youth Affairs maybe because they're looking, uh, they're particularly concerned about the Tusla situation. But actually, Tusla are not. Uh, well, we think our, the best estimate we have is that Tusla hire about forty percent of all social workers. There are four and a half thousand registered social workers in the, in the state. We don't know how many of those are actually currently working. We are not able to say exactly where they are working. This is basic information that we need. But ju just interrupt you, Professor, for a second. You're saying two step because of 40 percent, you know, they, we, we, they, they est estimate, estimate, yeah. yeah. But, but who says, who is it that has the power to say, right, okay, from now on, these students are going to uh, have their expenses paid. From now on, um, we're going to look at blah, blah, blah for all our social work. You know, uh, you're talking about the retention and recruitment of who has the final well, well, say? I think our view, I think, and you're would saying be, nobody. Our view would be, well, at the, mo at the moment, yes, nobody. Our view would be we, we, there needs to be a coordinated approach mm -hmm. uh, so that, Painful. for example, as in some other disciplines, people are paid mm -hmm. to, uh, during field work or at least have their expenses mm -hmm. paid. We have to look at making this whole pathway into social work, social work as a career more attractive. There needs mm, to be public mm. education about the value of social work as a career, the value to, to society, the value to the individual. Um, and would you the, not... And so who, who would, at the moment it's not clear who would actually would run you not such go, a campaign. Would you not make that your priority, to have one voice for all of Ireland, for all the social workers in Ireland, and to coordinate. Would you not make that your well, priority? That's a, that's a government function. The, the would you not make that request, though? The, we, we certainly see it as a very, very high priority, because it, it, from that, uh, clarity would, would flow a lot yeah. of better planning. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, can, can it's you... Professor Nurse, go ahead. Um, it's automatic. That's all, that's all, um, can I just say in response to your question, Senator, we have been raising this on a regular yeah, basis. Maybe. So. I took over as the head of my school in UCD five years ago. We had a meeting with Tusla at that stage with the view to establishing a third level liaison group. We raised it then and actually um, there was a series of meetings. Um, the issue still wasn't resolved and actually within the Dublin region it's become more problematic for us since then because obviously um, the availability of placements reflects the availability of social workers in, in the, the sector. Mm. Um, I, I do understand, I know I used the analogy of our relationship with St Vincent's Hospital in UCD earlier on, so I do understand the, the social work profession is, is more fragmented and diverse. Um, uh, but from our figures from our placements last year in UCD, um, about 40% of them came from Tusla and another 25% came from HSE or HSE funded organisations. So if we could form relationships with those two major employers, that would resolve a lot of our problems. Mm. Now, our students have to, the CORU, the, the regulator of qualifications requires our students to do two placements and we have a, a policy of giving them a kind of mainstream statutory placement in a major area of, of social work like um, child protection where many of our graduates would go into and then maybe a more specialist placement maybe in an NGO, in a disability mm. organisation. Um, but certainly if there was a, a stock of placements provided centrally from the two major mm. employers, mm. we have an infrastructure for securing them, um, mm. obviously within our, our um, third level institutions, which we can work with other organisations that would provide us with smaller yeah. numbers. Mm -hmm. the, the issue is just the lack of certainty year on year, mm, um, which means that, as, as I mentioned, once we commit to giving a student a place, we have to be able to deliver the training. 
Um, I feel I, I note that the government has taken action to address the placement costs in other professions, for instance, student teachers. Mm. Um, and I think in, 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 in just equity would demand that student social workers would, would, be, would be treated Can similarly. I answer very briefly, Chair, just, just to, to, to uh, Professor Norris. Um, my advice, you, you've said this has been brought up many times, my advice is that you adopt either a senator or a deputy who will pursue this for you and work in collaboration with you. Uh, and I really, I don't know, maybe you have somebody, but, but you need someone who's going to be being a pain, basically, until it is resolved. Thank, thank you for the advice, Senator. Um, I, I, I do wish to acknowledge that the Department of Children and Youth Affairs have recently taken action on this issue and um, are, are progressing this centrally. And um, uh, it does seem to me that some progress is being made. So uh, just to acknowledge that, that I, I do welcome their, their work and also the Department of Health. Um, so we've, we found that progress is, 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 is moving on. It's just, as I mentioned, it, it's not that we, I, 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 um, I, I, I wish to emphasise that it's not that we've been sitting on our, our oh, laurels and not raising mm -hmm. this as an mm -hmm. issue, mm -hmm. um, because also it, it creates practical concerns for us in terms of running the programme. Yeah, absolutely. So we have been raising it. Yes. As well, yes. Crazy. It dominates your your week. Yeah. And cost. Yes. 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 Obviously, we in, in terms of providing social work professional education, uh, we bear costs that other social professions don't bear, which, yeah, no, no. which we we cover from our fee income. So, um, there there are practical challenges. Just 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 before I um, invite. Uh, Deputy Rabbit in, um, just uh, uh, on foot of what you're, you're talking about, um, uh, Professor Gilligan, the, the, the whole approach to this process. What are, other, um, what are other jurisdictions doing in terms of collaboration between employers, educators and, 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 the, and, the, and the social workers themselves? I think you will find in other, in certainly our neighbouring jurisdictions and beyond, I think you will find a more uh, developed approach to workforce planning, mm -hmm. uh, which involves the key stakeholders, the education providers, the employers, uh, policy. The Would that be a government. formal body or? Yes, uh, in different, it, it might take different forms, but effectively a, a, a recognized formal uh, committee or, or a group uh, is charged with uh, managing uh, the, su the supply of sufficient uh, competent uh, graduates to, to meet the workforce needs in, in, with different specialisms and so on. So they monitor, they monitor, so the kind of issues around data, mm -hmm. trends, population trends, all of those things are being monitored and feedback from, you know, there's feedback coming back all the time how the system is working, mm -hmm. the adequacy of fieldwork provision, uh, maybe the adequacy of the, of the programs being provided inside the universities, uh, you know, the changing s social conditions may require new new uh, material to be taught and so on. So all of that, those conversations are taking place within some kind of a structure. Uh, and one of, I think one of our concerns would be, now we hope something like that is emerging, but I, th I think one of the challenges is to make sure that the key players are around the table mm. uh, and that they're fully engaged and that, that uh, there's a kind of a consistent push. Uh, sometimes I think there, that this issue has raises its head every so often and then it kind of subsides for a while, but it, it needs to be a consistent, uh, it needs to be getting consistent, and I think at this stage, urgent mm. attention. Okay, no, thank, thank you for that. Uh, Deputy Robert, please. Thank you, Chair. I think really what you're saying there, Professor Gilligan, is that there needs to be a permanent um, commitment um, at this moment in time. That's what's missing, missing is my reading on it, that there's no continuum, there's no permanency. And I think it was yourself, Dr. Halton, that said the reintroduction of what we had in the late 1990s is really what's required. And we do know that TUSLA is a new organisation and it was formed there late after that. But what we need to do is we need to go back to the service level agreement that was in place before the formation of TUSLA. That to me seems to be the piece that's missing, that while TUSLA was formed, certain service level agreements weren't followed through in relation to placements. Would that be a fair reading of it? Well, certainly if 
I answer the question. Yes. Certainly in the late 1990s, there was a similar problem in relation to the recruitment of social workers. And referring to what um, the chair said previously around, are we providing for the demand, which uh, uh, addresses your issue mm. as well. I would say that um, the, sir, when in the late 90s, when we had a demand for social workers and we weren't able to actually meet the, meet the demand uh, in the educational establishments in the universities, we got a service level agreement then and it worked extraordinarily well yes. across all of the universities. For expansion. Hmm? For expansion. Yes, for expansion. Yeah. Right. We doubled the numbers on all of our programs and, or in it, and introduced new programs in order to address the, the significant issue of recruitment of, of social workers. So to me it shows it has been done before oh, yes. and it can be done, done again, but the piece that's missing is that reintroduction and who it falls in under and who takes responsibility of it. To me, it feels like it falls with the Department of Children and Youth Affairs, but not necessarily so. Maybe it's the Department of Health. Maybe it's the buy-in of a number of other sectors, be it the Department of Justice with the youth provision and probation sector of it. But at the end of the day, what you do need is certainty. If you're delivering a course, there has to be a buy-in by all the others to provide you with your placements. You can't live year in year out wondering where your students are going if i was a student i certainly wouldn't be applying for a course that i didn't know i could actually get my placement out of it and get a variety of a placement uh, and that was my other question i wondered the students that goes on placements what is the fall off from that because there has to i would imagine there is a fallout or it's a factor in the fact of affordability is it an issue? Do you experience that as an issue? Yes. Um, well, just to return first to your um, comment just around the service level agreement, I suppose just from um, IT Sligo's point of view in, in the North West, and our, this is our first year rolling out this programme, um, certainly what I have found as placement coordinator is that services are more than willing um, yeah. to consider um, practice placements for students. Um, However, the reluctance to enter into a service level agreement because the fear that they may not be able to um, you know, stand over that agreement because, again, of staffing uh, deficits. Um, the, the, the staff are moving from one department to another and, indeed, from different services. So they, I think there is that fear that they won't be able to kind of um, stand over that, that agreement. Um, so, again, the verbal agreements are there, but again, I feel at government level there needs to be yeah, some provision that will support us and the mm. service providers in standing over th those agreements. Um, and to answer your second question, um, I suppose it's in relation to students' finances, mm. I suppose, and how they're actually managing. And certainly from my point of view, um, we kept our first cohort small because of the issue with place placements, because we were aware of the issue with practice mm. placements. Um, and certainly the small cohorts that we have this year um, have, all, have all come to me at some point with their concerns around finances. How are they going to manage to travel quite a distance to placement or to actually relocate um, for placement? Um, all of the students are hugely committed um, and they want to get the best placement um, opportunities that they can. But again, finances are kind of limiting them in terms of you know, how, how far they can travel or can they actually relocate. So it's, it's very difficult for them. Yeah. Dr. Halton, please. Response to one of the questions you asked around the fallout of students. We don't actually have students who fall out from the courses because of the lack of availability of placements. We work, as Professor Norris has said, really, really hard uh, to ensure that we do provide, because that's our responsibility. Once the student has actually registered, then obviously it is our responsibility to ensure that we get placements. So we hold the worry and we hold the risk and the uncertainty ourselves. We employ people in our universities to actually find placements. We recruit practice practitioners, we train them pro bono. We give them sort of all sorts of uh, CPD opportunities mm -hmm. in response to their commitment to take our students. So we have worked over many, many years to build relationships with right. people that are responsive to their needs as well as responsive to our needs to uh, acquire placements. All right. Um, I suppose in three sessions back we had the, the new CEO, Pat Rabbit, here before us and he took a lot of... Um, what would you say, details in relation to what we were bringing up. And I, I actually myself didn't realise how difficult it was for students to get placements till a young lady came before me and she said, I'm having a real difficulty. And I automatically turned and said, 
well, if I was you, I'd be looking to get placement in Thusla. Uh, um, and she explained to me how difficult it was to get placement. And, and I think, really, we, we need to have a strong advocate to ensure that that service level agreement uh, and um, the permanency comes back into it. Because you wouldn't have it in nursing. You wouldn't have it in teaching. They all get their placement. And we know there's a shortage there. So I think it, it needs, the focus needs to stay on. Because at the end of the day, the service is really crying out. And we won't ever address retention if we don't get the placements first, to be quite honest. And if I may add, this point about retention is really, it, it, it may strictly bound up with this issue yeah. of uh, recruitment and training, because obviously if uh, people leave, often they're experienced people who would have been uh, very good practice teachers, but because they leave, they're not available. So retention is, is, a, is, a, is a part of, of the whole uh, picture. Uh, and in a way, I think we have to face up to the to the hole in the bucket. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there is a hole in the bucket. People are leaving, uh, and we need there needs to be uh, policies put in place that improve uh, conditions for, particularly for younger, newly qualified people. They're really crucial that in their early years of their career. They they feel uh, you know well well supported and that therefore motivated to continue in the career. It's an excellent career, mm. but it's a challenging career. And it requires a, a lot of uh, commitment and ability on the part of the workers to do the job well. They need to be supported. Our training is a very important uh, launching pad for them, but they also need support uh, after they, they start. And that will turn them into good practice yeah. teachers who will then take the next generation of students and train sure. them. This is a really uh, important cycle that we have to mm -hmm. kind of really mind uh, to ensure that the next generation of the, tra of the trainers are there. Uh, and that they're taking the next generation of students who will be the next employees. All of this falls, you know, it, 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 it all sits together. We can't see one piece in isolation from we the can't. other pieces. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Mitchell, please. Uh, thanks for coming in on your presentations. I just have just a few brief questions. So what I'm taking from here now is that as this committee, we need to be going to the relevant people and say we need a body or a forum set up where it'll bring all the agencies together to find, you know, a policy or a, a direction. Would I be right in saying that, that that's one of the recommendations that I think we're getting from this here? Um, I just want to touch base. What, when we're talking about um, how can we find the placements, you know, for these students coming out? And I think that it, it's a major issue. Okay, we have the expenses situation, and I don't know how anybody could do it. Be honest with you. And obviously, some people are already paying for these co courses and all now. They're uh, more expenses, so it's mm. not really inviting people into it. But if we can touch back in around um, the retention thing, have you any ideas or policy changes that you would like to see? Because exactly what you have said, we're just, it's a hole in the bucket here. So we need to be looking at this approach because I, I don't see how we can do a recruitment drive a public recruitment drive to bring people in, unless we fix the problem. So I'm asking now, why are we losing social workers? We've had so many people coming in here, and I, I know myself from outside here, the turnover is unbelievable. And, it's all, and that in itself has a knock-on effect on the children, particularly in child protection. So what, what do we need? What, what, are two, so just an example, another agency is doing wrong. What do we need to do to retain the staff? We're talking, we've had organisations in here, we're saying you could have a social worker that have 30 cases, right? So do we need to be looking outside the box? Do we need to be looking at other jurisdictions, you know, what way other people do it? Well, I think if I may, sorry, excuse me. I'd like to answer that. Um, I'm actually a qualified registered social worker myself and I'm actually cl very close uh, from practice. I spent 12 years working in Tusla and some time in the HSE before I moved to the IT Sligo. Um, and certainly my own point of view is that um, it's extremely challenging work. Whether you work within children's services or adult services, social work is an extremely challenging role. Um, it's, it requires huge commitment and dedication from um, individuals and it has, the work has an emotional and psychological impact mm -hmm. on individuals and I don't think that there's enough support for that. We have supervision in practice but it's case supervision. What we need I think and certainly from speaking to my colleagues in my previous um, department is outside supervision. 
Um, so support from outside of the service that we can access um, maybe every six to eight weeks, um, which is a session for yourself with a psychotherapist or a counsellor okay. who understands the role of a social worker also. And I think that's really, really important. Uh, I would uh, support what, what has just been said by my colleague, but also maybe the point about can we learn from good practice in other jurisdictions. I think the answer clearly is yes, and I think we do need to do some uh, work on that. You know, this, if there was a national forum, uh, th this would be some of the, one of its tasks would be to identify good practice models from, out, from elsewhere in terms of early career support for uh, new social workers. Uh, Certainly, I'm aware from uh, examples from our own students or from colleagues abroad, uh, very well protected caseloads in the early first year of work is, will be very important with very high quality dedicated case supervision. I know there's other types of supervision as well, but good quality case supervision is very important. Uh, I was discussing with a colleague, a uh, fellow professor in England the other day, uh, very good practices in her local area where uh, the organisation, the local uh, uh, equivalent of TUSLA, has developed a new model of s a close supervision of pr practice by uh, social workers, which has, re has revolutionised mm -hmm. the retention rates. Um, so there are, it's not like we, we, there aren't things that, that can't sure. make a difference. There are things that can make a difference. But there needs to be a coordinated, consistent uh, effort in that, to, to move in that direction across different employers. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Dr. Holton was first, uh, and then Dr. McTaggart. Just in response to um, Deputy uh, Mitchell's uh, question in relation to supervision, uh, just to say to you that uh, supervision is being provided. So if you go to the providers of social workers, employers of social workers, they will say that supervision is provided. However, the nature of the supervision um, is primarily, as our colleague has said, in the area of management and administration. So the other aspects of the work, which are the emotional demands, the complexity of the work, uh, the support and the additional education that is required to uh, sustain yourself in a profession as complex as child protection and welfare requires a real commitment on behalf of employers to provide the necessary ongoing continuing professional development of young, very often young graduates, because it's also important for us to recognise that the vast majority of our students who actually are, have had placements in TUSA become employed by the agencies because of having got the experience and they haven't, haven't seen what they're capable of doing. We have high quality graduates coming from our programmes. And so we need, as you say, we absolutely need from the point of view of our service users to deliver high quality child protection and welfare services to vulnerable, very vulnerable service users. We need to sustain uh, a highly committed, educated and capable and competent workforce. And I think structures need to be put in place as, as our colleagues have said, protected caseloads, induction, a very clear induction policy, you know, and then supervision that is fit for purpose, that responds to the demands and challenges of the work, um, and that I attend to the emotional needs and challenges that our, our um, social workers are experiencing on the ground. They get it in other jurisdictions. Our graduates are moving to other jurisdictions yeah. to get this. You know, and we have lots of examples of where our graduates have moved and have come back and told us um, there is no comparison between what is on offer in other jurisdictions and what's on offer that, here. That was another question. Where are they going? Well, certainly from our point of view, we have um, our graduates are going to Canada. Quite a number of our graduates are going to Canada. They're going to the UK. They've gone to Australia. They've gone to the US. So they, they are actually yeah. internationally recognised as really, really highly competent graduates. And they really welcome them. The UK have come here in the mm. past. They continue to come here to try and recruit our graduates. So, I mean, they are really sort of graduates that are of high standing internationally, not just yeah, nationally. Yeah. Sorry, Dr. McTaggart, please. Uh, I agree with everything my colleagues have said. And just the difficulty is if, they, if there's any deficit at all during the learning experience in terms of good quality supervision during the learning, it, then it makes it more difficult to get people into very complex roles. It is probably compounded antidotally by there's a lot of acting posts. So the stability of the, the teams 
um, are sometimes, sometimes it's difficult for people to commit to give us placement because the people are in acting roles and they don't want to commit to it in case they are not appointed to their roles. So all of that exists and then we try and get them into settings then to work and there's opportunities in it and the teams can be a little bit um, not fully gelled because people are a little bit unsure. We know for, uh, in our experience in the North West, there's a couple of people who are more than willing to assist us but they're in acting positions. Now I don't know how long that normally takes but those acting positions are acting as a slight barrier for the people taking the students on placement and also obviously if people are moving around, I know it happened in, in my own careers, um, people move around, the team, it becomes very difficult to stabilise the team. So I don't know if there are any stats on that, I'm sure there are, but about how many people, how long people are in acting posts, but certainly up in the northwest, we are ha hearing anecdotally, it's fair to say, about people being in acting posts, and that's impacting and causing a challenge, both for the students getting them out in placement, but I'm sure within the teams themselves, those posts not being fully, you know, confirmed, or they're waiting for recruitment drives. I don't know. That's our experience up in the northwest. Mm -hmm. okay. so, again, you want to oh, uh, no, it's just to m note the point that's being made uh, that we are really working in an international labour market now in, this, in, in, in relation to many sets of graduates uh, and they, our graduates can really look around the world and think, okay, I have, I have a choice to work in Ireland or I have a choice to work in other countries. Cer certainly Australia is a big, a big recruiter, UK, Scotland, uh, other countries. So that's a reality. We have to, if we want to retain people in Ireland, we have to offer them uh, conditions that are at least comparable with what they can ex expect in other jurisdictions. And they're they're all highly networked, so they all know people a year or two older than them who are working in other systems and can tell them chapter and verse how the re the reality of the other systems. And this is very influential in terms of people's career choices. So can I just ask then, we can just go back to when you do find a placement. So can you just talk us through, like say if I'm a student now who, who gets a placement, what's involved, you know, uh, I, 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 when, are you going to be given caseloads as well? And who, who's minding you? Who's looking after your well-being, being the new, you know, student going out and some cases can be probably pretty horrific for, you know, a new someone on a placement. So can you just talk us through that, what supports are getting actually on the placements as well? Uh, well, certainly from our point of view, um, once the placement is secured, the student is um, then obviously advised and allocated to the placement, um, but it's the practice teacher who will allocate a caseload. Obviously, there's a lot of work done between um, our visiting tutors who are qualified mm. social workers from the, the institution um, in terms of what is an appropriate caseload for a student at year one or year two and so on. Um, and certainly there's negotiation around that. Students are then required, well, from, certainly from our point of view, to attend for an interview with their agency so that the agency can be sure that they're happy with the student and feel that they will be able to meet their learning needs within the setting. Um, once the placement then is confirmed after the interview, um, the student will get a start date, they'll begin their placement and within the first couple of weeks they will have a visit from their visiting tutor and that really, that visit is just to ensure that an induction has taken place, that the student is settling well and that they have begun or have completed their learning agreement. So the learning ag agreement really is a contract between the student and the practice teacher where they will identify uh, a number of learning objectives that they wish to achieve uh, throughout the placement and those learning objectives are in line with CARU uh, standards of proficiency for practice. Um, so the visiting tutor will then um, revise and review that just to make sure that it is all in line with uh, expectations of CARU um, and the student then needs to identify a plan with the practice teacher as to how they're going to meet those learning objectives. So that's the, the main piece of paperwork that will guide them through their placement um, and the practice teacher then will identify a caseload that will be appropriate for the student at their, the stage of learning that they're at um, and obviously build on that uh, throughout the placement. Um, students then get two more visits, um, a, a mid-placement meeting and an in-placement meeting visit from the visiting tutor as well and that's just a, a kind of a re review and monitoring process um, and again they're completing a, quite a substantial uh, placement portfolio while they're out on placement as well. Um, so they have an opportunity to discuss that with their visiting tutor and so they can get some advice and guidance around that also. Okay. Yes, yes. Just Dr. Adding to that, 
uh, because I think it's relevant to know that when we actually interview students for places on, on social work programmes, they then receive a placement or they, they receive a place on a programme and on rece receipt and acceptance of a place, they then have to take um, the Garda clearance certificate mm -hmm. and the fitness to practice. So basically, before they actually enter the, the programme at all, there is a requirement for um, Garda clearance and fitness yeah. to practice. Then on entry to the programme, all of the universities have uh, placement coordinators. They employ placement coordinators and their job is to actually go out there and seek placements uh, that are suitable for our graduates and there, there are sufficient of them for our graduates. And then, um, then students are invited to um, represent sort of their needs, even though we're not always able to respond to their needs, they may, those needs may be around sort of location because many mm -hmm. of our students have family commitments. They, uh, we live in a region, we're in Cork, they come from other regions, so therefore, <coughs> you know, they, um, they may re-establish <coughs> themselves in Cork from another area, a geographical area in the country, and so then we can't really require them to dislocate all of the children and family again to go to a placement, say, somewhere else mm. in another region. Um, uh, so, so that's significant. So they, they sort of tell us what, what are their absolute requirements, and then we attempt to try to respond as best we can to the needs that they have expressed, both financial needs, uh, location needs, all of those things. Um, and then on finding a placement, exactly what people have said, we try to allocate one of the two uh, placements within a statutory agency because that then makes them more employable within those mm. agencies when they actually go out into the workforce seeking work and then another one in one of the voluntary agencies um, or one of the, the, the um, mainly voluntary agencies as well. So, so effectively then they go out on placement, placement one and two. They do, as, as our colleagues have said, they interview for, for the, the placement, they engage with practice educators uh, around it, and then the whole procedure is that we then take responsibility for, for contracting with, with the, the supervisor and for developing learning contracts with the student, ensuring that the students, as tutors, we ensure the students' needs are protected out on placement um, and that they're known to the person who is supervising the student. So we are educating the practice teacher as well as sort of ensuring that this, the student's interests are served as well as learners. Yeah. you know, on, on site in placement. They're not actually replacing members of staff, they're mm. there to learn, yeah. and so therefore they must be protected there. Mm -hmm. if, if it might be a, sorry, excuse me. Uh, I, I, just, I just wanted to add, um, Deputy, um, the, the uh, running administration and length of placements is very closely regulated by CORU, the, the, the regulator, um, down to the number of hours <coughs> of placement. Um, and that's a major part of the um, process of accrediting our degrees. Um, so in terms of offering this the type of activity and type of experience and our standards of supervision, we, th this is what we're required to do. Um, uh, just, it might be of interest to the members of the committee just to clarify that uh, our students, are, while they are supernumerary they're not, uh, and they're not paid, uh, they are undertaking uh, real work with real people. Mm -hmm. So they, from very early in their placement, uh, they are actually meeting real people mm -hmm. with real uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're providing services to those people, and they're 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 obviously being closely supervised in doing that. But they are learning through doing. It's a very fundamental principle of social work training. It, it's an important principle in many uh, disciplines, mm -hmm. but uh, we, we, social work is particularly distinctive of that. That we actually, from very early days, people are actually <coughs> dealing with real issues and learning through doing. So they are making a contribution mm -hmm. uh, in the organisations where they where they are studying. Mm -hmm. I just ask uh, Ms. Feeney, um, what is the proximate cost, or there might be a bit of guesstimation in this, but what would the what is the cost of for a student of doing a placement in terms of travel, the length of time? Just, I mean, in your experience, I I, I understand your your course is only in existence for a year, but just yeah. as a course director. Well, certainly in terms of the financial costs, that's hard to answer because uh, some students are placed 
within an hour's distance of their base. Some students have to travel further and then have to consider maybe relocating. Other students are lucky enough to maybe get a placement closer to their base. So it can be different for each student. But certainly from our point of view this year, students have encouraged travel expenses to placements where they're traveling between 30 minutes to an hour each day um, to avail of their placement. Um, and so it would be significantly different than, for argument's sake, commuting from you know, one of the suburbs of Dublin, for instance, or, or even one of the surrounding counties. No, and yeah. I suppose the only difference is that these students aren't getting paid. They're not for, getting paid, of course. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, and so, somewhat of a difference. You know, some students rely on um, a third level grant uh, yeah. to, to get through their courses. Others are trying to work to subsidise, which can impact on their studies then absolutely. as well. Um, in terms of the time, I mean, my own memories of my masters are, are very similar to to what the feedback we get from our own students and that it requires a huge commitment in terms of time it's not just about the learning in, in the classroom environment it's all of that the learning and the independent uh, learning that needs to happen outside of that and um, the preparation for placement um, is is quite significant and while they're on placement they're also completing um, academic work um, along with as um, our colleague Professor Gilligan points out carrying out real work with real people yeah. they have case notes and reports to write on placement so it's it's a significant um, challenge for them in terms of, of time management and okay. no, no. Yes, Professor Norris. Chairman, I, I inquired with our second year students on, on this issue this year, and um, they estimated to me that where they were required to use their car for their job, it, in terms of visiting clients, etc., some students have given me estimates that they'd spent um, between €120 Euro to €260 Euro on petrol, which for a, a person reliant on a on third level grant is very, very substantial, yeah. just in terms of implementing the work. Um, they uh, they do it's 35 hours a week on placement, and then there is a study component allowed during the the working week um, to complete the assignments they're required to complete for the university. Um, during the um, the period they're in the university, then it's it's effectively full time um, uh, every day of the week. So a challenge we have is it's very difficult for our students to take part time employment. Um, uh, and fund themselves. In University College Dublin, we were also credited to run a part-time uh, offering of our master in, professional master in social work degree as well as full-time. And we find that the demand for the part-time programme is being quite seriously affected by the fact that um, students aren't eligible for third-level grants, part-time students. Um, so that's a, another practical suggestion. I'd, I'd, um, I'd just like to make um, two, 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 two follow-up questions for, for, for any willing um, uh, guest. Um, what is the gender balance of students and then the professional? And um, what's the dropout rate in education? Dr. McTaggart. Uh, primarily female in that okay. cohort. So we 90 have plus, plus, plus. 90% female, 10% right. male. Um, and the, the retention, I will go back to what our colleagues said, the retention on this program anyhow is going to be very strong because they're coming in fully committed to it. Yeah. They are aware and they are committed to this profession. So the retention, we have had one deferral, which is, you know, that's it, yeah. no dropouts. Okay. Um, and it's just they're very, very committed to it. Mm. It's just we're making it difficult for them to achieve it. Mm -hmm. I will speak, to, if you don't mind, I'll go back to the grants a little when I am talking. Um, the grant, you, you're means tested for grant funding. You're in employment the previous year. You're not going to get the grant. There was the notion of bursaries mentioned, but there is a problem with bursaries and getting grants at the same time because it doesn't allow for both of them. I absolutely would support bursaries, good quality bursaries that actually are nearly comparable to what it would be on employment for a year because you're asking so much. The workload is, it's the, it is one of the tougher masters I would say that I, I have between the, the transition to such a tough profession to the academic workload because it is a level nine and also then the professional. You've got the professional regulator and you have got QQI and you have to meet the requirements of both. So if there's any way that it can be supported in some way because you have 
definitely a, a cohort that are interested in being part of it. The difficulty is we'd have more of a cohort interested in it if there was more financial supports for them. Without a doubt, I would believe in our region anyhow. Okay. Um, anybody? Yes, so, Professor well, Mars. Certainly in UCD, it's, our student body are about 92% uh, female. Um, and we are committed to um, attracting more diverse cohort of students, including men, which are diversity <laughs> in our world, um, also including in the faculty. Um, but also, um, we're also committed to trying to facilitate larger numbers of uh, black and ethnic minority students um, as Ireland is diversifying and also as the client group in social work is diversifying. Sure. Um, that's a concern for us. We interview our students for entry to the programme and we have a very rigorous interview programme including interview by a member of faculty, a social work practitioner. Um, we have a written application form and, and uh, further testing on the day when they come for interview. Um, so um, the students we get through that programme are, are very committed and um, very high quality. So we have a, we have a very small dropout rate. Um, I would say out of our 100, probably uh, one a year. And then we have a very small failure rate of one to two a year out of the 100. Generally, where there's a fail, it's on the placement component. So that's, that it's another reason the, the management of that is obviously very challenging, which is another reason to try to formalise arrangements. Okay. The, uh, Dr. Halton. Yes, I would concur with what uh, Professor Norris has said. We have a very, very low dropout dropout rate because of the commitment of staff and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, the commitment of practitioners um, and and also the commitment of students they have to go through a very rigorous process and um, and if they achieve success within that process of selection then they are absolutely committed to sustaining themselves on the program uh, and what we've all said really and i suppose it's really important to reiterate you know uh, it is a very rigorous program the, the master of social work program or the bachelor of social work program are both really rigorous sort of uh, programs and they are very demanding of, of of our students in terms of the diversity the bachelor of social work programs there was one in um, in trinity college dublin and one in ucc the one in ucc is for mature entry and certainly we have really improved the diversity of, of, of people who are entering the profession through that pathway to the profession. Uh, and I would support any endeavours to actually increase that diversity, whether it's ethnic, ethnic minority diversity or whether it's gender diversity. Okay. Professor uh, The, the uh, Trinity uh, programme, our bachelor's degree programme, has uh, a provision historically, very long standing for provision to admit a, a substantial proportion of mature students, so people over 23 years of age. Trinity pioneered this approach in higher education going way back, but uh, we certainly, it's very, very strongly part of the social work education tradition in Trinity. Uh, and this is important, I think, to think of age as well as another variable in terms of diversity. P people entering uh, uh, social work uh, later in life, they may bring some, some extra uh, experience and, and insights. Uh, but it's also very important to have people from different social backgrounds, uh, social class background, and our t access programs are, uh, in, you know, provide a pathway uh, that opens up for social work as, as for other uh, uh, courses. Uh, and we do see more minor, my ethnic minority students from or immigrant st background students uh, appearing in our in our classrooms, which we're very pleased <coughs> pleased to see. Okay. So that, that, again, that, those are issues that, that are an important element of the whole kind of workforce planning that we that we have a workforce that reflects uh, the, the the people who are using the services. Mm -hmm. uh, Deputy Neville. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just in relation to the recruitment. My own opinion on this, and it's based on um, sitting on the mental health committee as well, that in the public service, particularly around health, and obviously the likes of social workers coming in under TUSLA, which was under health or under HSE, is the rigidity of the centralised recruitment system is hampering, I think, in a market where we have scarce supply. Uh, my own background is I've spent eight years as a recruiter around the world and a headhunter. And in a market of where you have lack of supply, you need high flexibility. I mean real-time flexibility. And that's what happens in the private sector. And in the private sector, you actually headhunt. You go out and you headhunt. You don't even rely on reactive advertising or recruiting because it doesn't work. You're in such a tight market. 
Um, and I think that's something as a government that as a whole needs to look at. Um, and I've been calling on it for quite a while. The problem is obviously you're dealing with a, a, a big, big departments that you're trying to move as well. And I understand that because I have recruited internally as well in the private sector for our multinationals. But they're able to get it right to be able to react to the market. So there's no reason why the public service shouldn't be able to react to it. That will take some sort of leadership for it right, sitting down with unions uh, in trying to uh, gain that flexibility. Because on the flip side is when the, when the markets do turn the other way, then obviously you, have may, you may have oversupply um, and you can be a lot more, I think your systems can be a lot more, the, the criteria to recruit changes. All right. That's not taken away from the fact that you want the best person for the best job or the best qualified person, should I say, for the job or the person who is qualified to do the job. But I think in relation to recruitment, it's flexibility. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, it, as you have quite rightly said, it's a global market now. And I think Ireland needs to react to that. Um, I don't think we're reacting enough for it. During the recession, I went to Australia. I was a recruiter and I actually hired people from Ireland. Um, it was quite easy. There was a flow from Ireland of, of graduates, of people, because there was no work here. Um, I think Ireland needs to look at trying to bring those back, but I think they need to do a study, whether it's through the universities or what, at what point in time does an immigrant look at coming back or at what point in time do they look at making that critical decision? Because a lot of times people will go not because of the job, but because of wanting to experience the world, and that's fair enough. We live in a small island, you know, it's a big world out there. Um, but there are points in their time, maybe three and four years away, when they actually look at settling and they're going, well, am I going to actually settle in this foreign country? And they'll think about coming back and they will make that critical decision. And once they settle in that country, it's very difficult to bring them back if they get married or have kids or whatever. But it's at that point where they make their decision. And I think we need to do more, whether it's through the universities, uh, in ascertaining where that point happens and actually targeting that point and bringing, and bringing those people back. Secondly, in relation to multiculturalism, because we're in a global market, Ireland needs to start grappling with the fact you've, you've welcomed the fact that you've people from different backgrounds applying for these positions. I think we need to do more on that. We need to start competing on that. The likes of Australia do have more resources to pay people. It's just that's a fact. Fact of life, they have more natural resources. They're a bigger country. Their continent is the size of Europe. Uh, we haven't, we're having to deal with that. And I know that there is uh, issues around remuneration um, and also conditions. We can work on the conditions. Um, I just want to ask, has there any studies been done about what I've spoken about from your perspective in when graduate or when people will make those critical decisions? Have you even done graduate surveys in relation to what way people are thinking? If it's a case that we're going to start paying for, we'll say, experience through the graduate program, what will your thoughts be on compelling graduates to work maybe two years or three years or whatever after their uh, graduation in order to facilitate that? Is it a runner? Is it a non-runner? Will it turn people off? Just It would be uh, interesting to get your thoughts around that. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Dr. Halton. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, thank you, Deputy. Um, in relation to um, our graduates, my I've been director of the Masters of Social Work program for about nine or ten years at this point in time. I've been involved in social work education for much longer than that. Uh, and my own um, knowledge of the field is that our graduates, the vast majority of them want to stay in Ireland. However, there are always a few that will choose on graduation to go outside of Ireland, probably three or four every single year on our master's program. Um, in terms of those graduates that I know who go abroad, um, and from what I know about what they say about the reasons for choosing to go abroad, which is anecdotal rather than a sort of systematic research, is that um, they, ha they are leaving behind sort of, um, some of them want to do what you say, which is to travel the world. And it's great that we have graduates that actually have a license to travel the world with, um, with, with the credentials that we give them. Um, we're highly educated, we're a very highly educated workforce. Um, however, um, there are others who are leaving disaffected from their experiences of being in social work. And, um, and I think while... Um, Sorry, they pursue social work in a new place, they yes, go to where they yes, change careers? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, we, have, we have research on, on issues around retention. There is some internal research uh, done in TUSA which isn't available in the, in the public domain as I understand it. And there's also, uh, there is, our colleagues have um, undertaken research in relation to uh, 
the TUSLA services and, 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 and the retention of social workers there. And the, and the issues that come up are the ones that we've already spoken about, which are around issues around support, supervision, continuing professional development, structures that actually embed within them the need for a responsive way of, 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 of treating okay. the challenges that the people experience. Okay. Feeney, please. Um, just to add to that, and I know Professor Gilligan alluded to this earlier, but I do think from my own experience, I'm not far from practice myself, um, and my own experience as a manager, having had a number of uh, newly qualified social workers come into a team um, who chose not to stay for the various reasons that you have outlined, um, Professor Holt, um, I suppose what I feel is that if there was some sort of a graduate programme established, um, and they, some of the graduates come through um, agencies that provide workers for um, TUSA and the HSC, but there, there's no support with, that comes with that. So I think if there was some sort of um, a graduate programme set up where graduates could access outside supervision and some sort of mentoring okay. um, from experienced, professionally qualified social workers um, that would help them um, to kind of maintain and sustain mm -hmm. the role that they're in um, better, I think that would make a huge difference. Um, and that's just speaking from my own experience. Where I, sorry to cut across you just while we're on this train of thought. Given the, the lack of supply, I would assume it would be very difficult to find social workers to supervise or mentor because they may not be there or their workload is very heavy. Um, well, certainly, I've had conversations with colleagues around this, and yeah. we've we've kind of brainstormed our thoughts around mm -hmm. how we might be able to even set up a graduate program. Um, and certainly, um, I have a number of um, colleagues with many years' experience who would feel that they should be taken on a mentoring role then, because okay. they feel that would they have the time to do it though, given this, the pressures. And again, I think it would be something that they would be doing in their own time. I think it would be outside of their their working role. Um, something that they might have to and do in their own time. Okay. I, ha I suppose I can't... I, I understand. No, no, that's what I'm trying to, more I'm trying to tease it. it out. Yeah. The other yeah. thing is, uh, what, for somebody to retire from, from Tusla, what age do they have to be to retire? Is it 66? Do they have to retire? I think, well, I'm 68. Yeah, well, I think 66. The retirement date has would, been would, would, to would there be, would there be merit there for former social workers who have to retire at 66 to actually come back into the system for, uh, in a mentoring capacity, solely just in a mentoring capacity? Would there be a, a, a would there be an avenue for that? Would there be an appetite for it? Because they wouldn't be working full time. They may be in a mentoring role. It could be ten hours a week, twenty hours a week, whatever, in a support type role. Because it, it goes back to the fact that that one of the other issues I've been working about working on is is older people trying to look for work in the workforce are being just covertly discriminated against. I'm not saying it's happening in Tusla, but I'm saying just across the board as a culture, it's happening covertly and we're seeing people retiring at 66 walking out the door with a huge amount of skills now if they want to retire and and finish with that that's fine they should be allowed to do that because they've worked all their lives but there's another cohort there that are walking out the door with a specific an abundance of skills and it goes back to the debate and you have younger people who don't have the life experience who need that support and there's no synergy between both and this is exactly what you're speaking about that there's probably a cohort there that have retired that would work maybe 10 hours a week or 15 hours a week just to keep in touch from a mentoring point of view but wouldn't have the pressures or, or the added the added weights that are happening as part of the role and i think maybe out of this report of the committee uh, chairperson that that could be looked at to facilitate the likes of that and I think that that's something we're at 5.4 percent unemployment I mean and that's something we can look at I think there's a huge amount of skills out there and it may be something you might want to brainstorm yourselves when you're doing your own studies mm -hmm. is in relation to people that have retired mm -hmm. because I'm sure there's some people out there I see them working in community tribe organizations that are giving back in that way mm -hmm. and they're going from 100 volts an hour to zero and it's just it's a little taper off maybe three four years and the, the amount of knowledge they could give back and support I think is phenomenal Thank you. Uh, Just a point, I think this is a very important issue about, about different forms of support uh, for people in their careers uh, at an early stage and, and later. And I think one of the issues that uh, I would hope the committee might give consideration to mentioning is continuous professional development mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a systematic and structured approach to that, which would include, I think, uh, opportunities like structured approaches to mentoring and so on, but which also really that we that as a, to make social work an, a, an attractive uh, option in, in career terms, that employers should be offering a, a clear pathway of professional development 
uh, structured pathway of professional development so that people, by staying in the system, they gain access to various opportunities which will enhance their career and maybe their promotion opportunities and their, their, their capacity to do the job in a satisfying way. And maybe those are the kind of things they hear about uh, on offer in other, in other countries and that may draw some of them away. And if we can reduce to some extent the numbers of people who feel motivated to leave, uh, by better conditions abroad, that would have an impact. If we can also attract back some of the people by offering them good uh, opportunities similar to the ones they, that attracted them away in the first place, that would have an impact. So improving, uh, you know, making the, the hole in the bucket smaller is really important and it's, it's done by a, a series of incremental measures. But I would say con continuous professional development is a really important piece in the jigsaw that we shouldn't lose sight of. It, 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 it makes for a more stable, uh, committed and effective workforce. Uh, Dr. Holton and then yeah, Professor In response Norris. to your, your question around mentors of, yes. of mentorship by staff who are leaving, um, I, that already exists regionally okay. and, um, and is working very well and we Good. would absolutely, mm -hmm. certainly in the south, we have sort of examples of it, and I actually think it's a very, very good suggestion. Um, the other issue around supervision, it is a requirement to be a registered professional with CREW to actually have supervision. So you are required as part of your continued registration with the profession to actually have supervision. And it would be our belief that that supervision should be provided within the employment establishments where people are employed. Uh, I think there may be a place for external supervision as well, but I think it's absolutely necessary that actual uh, people who are employed by organisations are actually provided with appropriate supervision to respond appropriately yeah. to the demands of the job. Um, and, and when you um, say supervision, obviously you're separating supervision from mentorship. Two yes. Different avenues, yes. Yeah. And supervision very much is around sort of the provision of administrative and management type supervision, the provision of educative supervision and the, prov the provision of support. So any supervision arrangement should be contracted with the inclusion of all three elements of a supervision agreement. And, um, and what our workers are telling us on the ground, not, not just in Tusla, is that very often supervision is dedicated to the management and administration of the work and that aspects of the emotional and supportive side of the work are not attended to. Okay. And we also know from the retention uh, research that has been done that it is those aspects that become the sort of uh, the variables yeah. which actually make dis that, that influence people in terms of making their decision to either stay or leave. So, so through the chair it's the softer, just the softer yeah. things for want yeah. of a better word, the emotional yeah. support or support groups or something yes. like that, that the lack of yes. that yeah. is... Yeah. Yes and actually practitioners are setting up their own reflective peer support groups throughout yeah. the country yeah. in recognition of the need for, uh, for this quality of sort of support and engagement. So they are doing it, they're doing it themselves, and, and, uh, and we would say that that is a good and positive step forward because we have proactive uh, professionals out there uh, sort of working on their own behalf to address issues. We don't have a workforce that are waiting for people no, to no, actually no. deliver them. Uh, of services. They are really actively attempting to address really serious concerns that they have and about their own needs for support and we would like to support them in that and yeah. anything we can do that actually progresses these kind of um, sort of developments I think we would be okay. happy to support. Chair, just one final question in relation to recruitment. If we were to move from a centralised national level of recruitment to more of a localised type mm -hmm. recruitment setting, would that help? I, I certainly think it would. Yeah. I think that would definitely help. My own experience, um, you know, from practice was that the, pa the, the national panels that were formed were actually um, clogging up the system, for want of a better word. Um, Can you give me an example? Often, um, well, I suppose that there was a, a number of professionals on panels that were already in posts that were hoping to use that opportunity to move from their current post to another post yeah. um, and we'll say newly qualified graduates sometimes weren't actually making panels so yeah. they weren't actually being panelled um, so there was a backlog then where th the panels were there but the people that were on those panels didn't necessarily want the jobs that were becoming available because they might be already in that department or in that service 
Um, and from my own point of view, there were a number of uh, times where we had to recruit from TTM or CPL um, and the people that we brought to the agency then had told us that they didn't make the national panels um, because the competition was so competitive at the time and there was a lot more, a lot more um, experienced practitioners uh, coming high up on those panels. So from our point of view, we, off, we felt at that point that if we were able to run our, oak, our local campaign for recruitment, that we would have been able to recruit far quicker. Yeah. Professor Norris, you wanted to come in. I, I just wanted to, to um, respond to your point, um, Deputy Neville, about requiring graduates to work for a certain amount of period, mm. for instance, in, a, in the... That's if they get in, paid through the practice. Yeah, yeah well, I suppose I have... Uh, this. My own personal view is... I, I, I suppose I have ethical concerns about requiring people who decide to qualify in a very socially valuable profession like social work to do some things, require that, that we don't require of graduates in other areas such as business, etc. So I suppose I, I have an ethical issue about it. I also want, and where there's bursaries provided, of course that's entirely appropriate. And in the 1990s, as, as Dr. Houghton mentioned, when we um, increased our output of students very radically, um, uh, there was a practice of providing bursaries and then students working for a number of years, which worked very well. Um, the other point I, I just wanted to, to make is that um, in UCD, we run a two-year professional Master of Social Work programme, and our students are largely self-funding. They're not entirely self-funding, but all the universities are less than 50% state-funded. Mm -hmm. I think in, in UCD, we're in, in, the, in the high 30%. Most of that money is for the so-called free fees for undergraduates. Um, we, then we get a proportion of block grants to run the, the university. But the students for a master's programme are paying the vast bulk of their costs from their student fee of between eight and nine thousand euro a year. They're the, they're the fees to cover the programme. Mm. So um, I, can, I can understand why it would ostensibly seem attractive and there's certainly an argument where people are being funded by the, the government. It's entirely reasonable to request that. But for our, our students, I, I have an issue, an issue um, about it. And also just around the, the issue of attracting people into these professions with these requirements. Yeah. I just, that's my personal view. Yeah, okay. Um, okay just right. in response. Appreciate that. Yeah. Dr. McTaggart, please. Yeah. We have had more students this year. I wouldn't really agree with a graduate programme, but I certainly would agree with a bursary programme, the slight difference within them. Um, we would have had more people, a lot of people who were then too slow working in posts would have liked to come on the programme, but financially they couldn't afford it. So this would have been an opportunity. And TUSLA did approach us when we originally were doing the programme about trying to find funded bursaries because the people would intend to stay with them anyhow. And the difficulty became with grants and bursaries and the, the difficulties with both systems. Um, so I, I would. And when I worked in the health service, I did get partially funded for a programme. Um, I had to stay there for a year and a half. I had yeah. to commit to that. Uh, I didn't find it a barrier. I intended to stay there. So for the people who are in, particularly Tusla, yeah. who want to who want to transition or you know develop their career in another direction, perhaps mm -hmm. that's a, a definite option for them because we had at least quite a number that I would say that were interested in that, but they couldn't afford to. So definitely, I would be supportive of it within that kind of frame. Yeah. So but, the, uh, sorry, no. Yeah, I just sorry. want to tease out the panel question I was asking mm -hmm. there. In relation to the panel, you were saying that the, the panels get clogged with people, right? But what happens? I'm just trying to understand this, the minutiae of this. They're offered a role and they turn it down, is it? And they just stay on the panel. Yeah, look, look, I can only speak from my yeah, own I experience, yeah. I suppose, and what we—that's what I would have felt. Uh, and as a department or a service at the time, we would have felt. And the other issue was that there were a number of people. Um, you know, accepting posts in a certain geographical area, yeah. but not necessarily the geographical area that they wanted to settle in. So they would accept that post and then within a year maybe be gone again because they got a post in a geographical area that suited them better. So that then was causing a lot of movement um, in, in departments as well. So, um, and again, for service users, um, that's, that's not ideal that, you know, you have a social worker for six to 12 months and then it changes again. You've only just begun to build a relationship with someone at that point. Um, so it's not ideal, but certainly that they were the issues that I would have felt and certainly my colleagues would have felt at the time. Um, and that should we, or where we were able to recruit locally or run local campaigns, um, it would have alleviated a lot of that. So it would have stopped, yeah, the, the people trying to move from Galway to Dublin or, you know, when you're recruiting in Galway, it's 
Galway orientated yeah. candidates to come in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Can I just say, uh, Senator Clifford Lee is going to ask a question in a minute, but I just, I just want to ask one final question myself. If, if, if students uh, were the benefit uh, of a grant or a bursary to support them, particularly in relation to their placement, which is a, an absolute requirement, put a figure on it. Because I don't know, so I need to know. Put a figure on it for me. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to mark you down now. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, just, just to get a little bit of hist personal history. Both both of us are beneficiaries of bursaries back in the day, back in the 70s. <laughs> so the system, the, the, yeah. we could imagine doing that in the 70s, and we're struggling to do it. Yes. In, oh, I know. Today. I acknowledge that. So, uh, and it was a good investment. We're still around. Yeah. <laughs> They've retained us. <laughs> high, scoring high on retention. Uh, and my recollection is, at that time, we were paid uh, a bursary of 3,000 punts. So if Which you translated 3,000 punts into the days, that was a substantial commitment. That's a salary. Right, yeah. That's a house. You might have got more than me. <laughs> 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 well, anyway, the, yeah. Right, yeah. We need to yeah, check the figures. But well, in, the early, in, the early, in the early 1970s, that's a house in the suburbs of Dublin. Well, I, we would need to check the exact figure, but uh, it was, it was a, certainly a... You know, Bowman, to be precise. It, it, was, yeah. it was worthwhile. So... Um, I think that we would, you would, would some some work would need to be done on that. Yeah, but I would have thought you're talking about you know what is the what is the salary and it has to be a reasonable proportion of a salary. I think the, the issue that in many disciplines people are being paid some kind of a trainee uh, salary. They are. That is you know maybe that's where we need to get to yes. in terms of it, in, and then building in some kind of requirement that people stay on afterwards. But uh, your your qualification, if I'm not mistaken, the qualification in terms of the being able to practice is contingent, like I'm thinking of uh, solicitors, mm -hmm. for instance, who have their, their, their work placement, but they're, they're still a solicitor, mm -hmm. they're not permitted to practice mm -hmm. until they do their, their placement. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 from what I'm gathering, yours is structured slightly differently. The placement arrives and the, degree, and the award arrives thereafter. Yeah, they, right? the, placement right? and, and mm -hmm. the placement and the actual academic yeah. uh, qualification are done together. Together. Okay, so, so from a practical yes. perspective then, perhaps that's something that you as, as the, uh, the experts in the field might consider and compare yourself to another industry. And this is just, yeah. Yeah. from my perspective, as a complete outsider, mm -hmm. making an observation of, that, of your own observation mm -hmm. that in, individuals in workplace placements are paid uh, a small amount, albeit, but they're still paid, and of course that will go a long way, particularly in relation to those and the point that you made, Ms Feeney, which I think is quite stark, uh, that individuals are not going to get a grant under any circumstances because the chances are they were working in the previous year, even though they may have zero income and very, very small savings. And it, it, I can think of plenty of other industries, one that I'm involved in through marriage, that, that is... That is uh, horrible in that sense because it it's not just about the education it's the practice afterwards that takes years before there's a, you even break even uh, mm -hmm. and then you've got to try and figure out how to pay back the debts from the preceding 10 years mm -hmm. but and uh, that, that <laughs> that's from experience but uh, I, would, Dr. I would add to that we had they're finishing on friday and i'm sure it's the same for colleagues they're finishing on friday and they're doing night duty saturday and friday saturday and possibly sunday night to yeah. try and sustain this they're effectively working a full-time yeah. job over the weekend and that's, that's what they're doing to try and and we are in the northwest it's it, obviously it's a different socioeconomic place but everybody has experienced this everybody has students who fall into these categories these students will stay we really need to do something i do not like nursing students which i am i got paid mm -hmm. not very much but i got paid to do my training and it is a training that is to be professional in your practice so yeah. absolutely if we can I can come up with any figure you want, but it's, you know, I'd need to be evidence informed and, and it definitely needs to be comparable to what you would get in a job because there, it is compromising the learning, the additionality of working the whole weekend. They there are tired without a doubt when they come in on Monday morning. Yeah. So if we can mitigate against that, we will have better results, yeah. better professionally qualified social workers. Well, you're, you're currently in a self-fulfilling self self spiral. Yes. You, you yeah. can't get the placements because you can't get the mm. social workers, you can't get the social workers because you can't get the placements. Mm -hmm. And that will continue until there's an intervention. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just 
Can I say, Chairman, yes, even just Professor. making the civil service mileage rates available to students mm -hmm. on placement would actually be a, an enormous help. Probably. Because yeah. we have found in the, the Dublin region, students are loath to take placements outside yeah. Yeah, yeah. inner city I, I, I urban areas where they're required to use their car mm -hmm. because they just simply can't <laughs> afford to fund it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, good. You're also breeding in an environment where um, only those with the financial support yeah, of their families yeah. are capable yes. of doing the right oh, that, that, yeah. that, That's all understood and accepted. Thank you. Senator Clifford Lee, and then we'll wrap Thank up. Thank you, Chairman. Thank and you. just before I ask my question, I just want to point out just an accuracy there in relation to solicitors training. I'm a qualified solicitor. You are. When solicitors are uh, on their work placement, they're not qualified solicitors at that point. They're doing their work placement, their traineeship in between their professional no, practice they, courses in Black Hole Place. No, sorry, maybe I was incorrect, but yeah. my, I, I, they yeah, have were. completed their educational training. It's no, they the have not. The practice certificate no. only comes with... No. No, no. Oh, okay, no. I'm wrong. That's, sorry. Yeah, no. I wasn't aware you, of that. They Thank, do you. Their, Thank you for correcting They me. do <laughs> their academic training in between different kind of pockets of, of traineeship, so it's over okay. like two and a half year period, so they do a couple of months, couple of months, couple of months. Okay. It's broken down into blocks. But anyway, I just want to ask a question about the pay levels of new entrants and do you think they're sufficient and given the um, percentage of new, uh, new entrants into, or sorry, given the percentage of social workers is 90% female and given the gender pay gap in Ireland and that traditionally female dominated professions are lowly paid. And would you have any comment to make in relation to that? And I note your, your comment there that your, that your bursary, uh, you might have gotten more than your female colleague back in the day, but is it the situation today that female-dominated professions, uh, well, we know it is the situation that female-dominated professions are lowly paid, and do you think that's um, a, a big factor in, in relation to the, the pay for new entrants? I certainly, I, I do think that um, the current um, pay rate for a newly qualified entrance doesn't reflect the work. Um, it doesn't, um, and there's there's no easy way of saying that. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, it does need to be reviewed. Um, I think social work um, salaries in general would need to be reviewed because um, I suppose the incentive for people to stay after your seven years experience in as a social worker. Um, on a basic grade social worker, if you're not interested in management or any of that, the pay scale stops there and there's no incentive for you to stay in a highly challenging job. Now, I know they've reintroduced um, the senior practitioner role, but again, the, I don't think the pay rates w would reflect um, what's required of somebody in that role. So. Uh, Dr. Halton. Just responding to that again, I agree with uh, what my colleague has said. We also know that um, child protection and welfare social workers in other jurisdictions are paid higher levels of salaries for that work than their colleagues who are doing social work in other areas. So this is currently being debated with the unions in relation to whether or not that would be an attractive proposition. Certainly the levels of complexity of the work are very high, the demands of the work are very high, and I agree, I think any sort of reconsideration of pay levels would again attract people to the profession. However, we do know that there are, uh, that people who come to social work, while obviously, um, salaries are really important when you ask them sort of um, what attracts them to the work. The salary is important, but they could get similar salaries in lots of other areas of work which are far less onerous and they still choose to do social work. So I do think your point is very well made. I do think it's really important because it is primarily a female profession and it is prim primarily what was considered previously in our day a vocation. You know, maybe less so now, but certainly the people who come to it are people who actually have really significant vocational qualities to the work and really are very committed and dedicated to respond to very, very complex, challenging and demanding needs of service users. Professor Nurse. At the risk of making myself unpopular among my <laughs> social work colleagues, um, I actually don't think there is an issue with um, entry-level salaries in social work, which are comparable to other social education professions and, for instance, care, compare well to entry levels for academics. I think the issue, and this, this is what our students say to me, the, the issue is more um, that the salary is uniform across the profession. Um, and there are some areas of social work that are particularly 
stressful and demanding, such as child protection social work, as, as Dr. Holton mentioned. And the pay is uniform, and people tend to move and specialise and move out of child protection social work into, into other areas that are very challenging and valuable, but, but less stressful. So that is a concern. The other issue is around progression. Um, so um, I was very pleased to see at your last um, uh, meeting with the colleagues from Tusla that they talked about the, the uh, systems they're putting in place to provide a, a more well-developed career structure for social workers. So the, the, the key issue, we, we acknowledge we need, we need more graduates going in at the entry level, but the, the issue is retaining them, and part of that is providing a career structure. And, Excuse and me, I've just been called to vote on the Shannon, so apologies, and I will be looking back at the rest of your contributions uh, to, to my answer to my question. Thank you. Thank you. Is there, is there a, um, that, that scale, uh, there's always mm. a scale, um, is, is the scale also a barrier in, in, in your opinion? I mean, you're talking about per career progression. Clearly, that's you know yeah. promotion and responsibilities, and with that comes yeah. the, the, another move on the scale. But in, you know, the scale, the pay scale is quite short, to my knowledge. It's at short, entry level. Okay. So that I suppose that's Since an issue there, rather than the, so. the, the level of pay on entry. Okay. Okay. With the gender pay gap, like a lot of the, the reasons why women see uh, like a, a loss in salary as they work their mm -hmm. way through the career is because they they can't avail of. Mm -hmm promotional opportunities but yeah. if you're saying within your profession that's 90 percent female there are no pr promotional opportunities that's very very stark and very serious and it's something i'd like to see addressed thank you sorry, sorry can i just uh, correct is it isn't Go that ahead, there Dr. are no Mm -hmm. uh, there are no opportunities for progression. It's that when you progress within social work, the progression route primarily is, as our, my colleague has said, mm -hmm. through management. Yes. And many people want to stay in direct yes. line yes. practice. Of course. And then there are yes. far less. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, if I may interject, that I think is a really crucial point that we need to create uh, structures that allow people to stay in frontline practice mm -hmm. and that keep expertise at the front line and not necessarily in management and that people are rewarded for staying in the, yeah. staying at the front line. And I don't I don't think anybody here would, would disagree with that sentiment. I, I mean it, it, the, the profession is, is 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 essential. We're putting more and more pressure on it on uh, an annual basis through the actions of, of, of both houses of the Oireachtas and the department and other departments, not just the Department of Children. Um, and therefore, you know, there, there has to be recognition of that. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't wish to infer or have it inferred from this committee that, um, you know, we don't acknowledge the critical work that's done, but also at the same time, we don't necessarily want to devalue other professions by, you know, putting in long service increments or something along those lines. Although I know it's been done in some other professions, but only some, and that's, there's no uniform approach to public service pay in this country, and that's one of the biggest issues that we have. I, I don't, um, judging by the looks I just got, I'm assuming you all, you're all in agreement with me. So, um, definitely, uh, uh, do you want you to finish just wrap up? up? Yeah, yeah, just before you finish up there, Chair, can I thank you very much for coming in. I think it was a very informative session. Mm -hmm. It's one of the few sessions where people come before us with solutions or with experience from the past. And I think it was in your opening statements, and that to me is welcome, that you've already given us the hook where it can be hooked on, uh, and experience would say it has happened in the past, it can happen again. And I think it's incumbent on us to, to put that pressure on. But thank you for coming with solution-based ideas, because that doesn't often happen when people come before us that committee. So I just want to say it's welcome today, and thank you very much for that. Thank you, Deputy. Okay. Um, well, on behalf of the committee... Um, I wish to thank you sincerely for your presentations today and dealing with all of the questions thrown at you. Um, just uh, by, for the members, um, I believe it appropriate that we seek the views of the Department of Children and Youth Affairs uh, mm -hmm. on this issue and ask for a submission uh, mm -hmm. in advance, obviously, of, of the, uh, the, the beginning of the process to, to, to put the report together. Mm -hmm. So just with your agreement, I should have mentioned it earlier, but... Yes. Um, we, we will do that um, as soon as possible. So meeting of the Joint Committee is adjourned until the 8th of May. Thank, Thank you very much. So much. Thank you.